Okay, so what I've tried to do on this review is put like a main topic slide. And these I think will hopefully be beneficial. You need to make sure, I think Thursday night, maybe the last one of, not the last thing you do, but Thursday as you're studying, go through these little summary pages. And I'm gonna try to do this for every chapter we review and make sure you can tell yourself something about each of these things and that you feel confident and you recognize what that topic means or is. And if you don't, then go back and find that topic in your slides or in the textbook or a problem to work and work a problem on that topic, okay? I'm not saying you have to work 10 problems on that topic, but at least an example to help refresh your memory on what that is, okay? So the main topics for chapter 12, we identified functional groups. Um, we looked at isomers and conformers, condensed structures and line structures. These are just different representations of molecules. Um, and then naming straight, branched, and branch chain and cyclic alkanes. Um, we talked about how to name substituents, specifically methyl, ethyl, propyl, and butyl substituents. There might be times you also have like a hydroxyl group as a substituent or a halogen atom as a substituent, know how to name those. Um, and then classifying carbons as primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. And then the only type of reaction we looked at with alkanes was a combustion reaction. I don't think I have a problem on combustion reactions, so just remember this, that um, you have some sort of hydrocarbon. So actually I might, did I put a, let me go over this real quick. You have some sort of hydrocarbon. So let's say it's like C2H6, and then it's always reacting with oxygen. These are, these are always your two reactants, some sort of hydrocarbon with oxygen. And what do these make? Anybody remember what this makes? Same products every time. Is one of them water? Yep. What's the other one? Is it carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide, and then you would just make sure it's balanced. That is a combustion reaction. Always the same two products. And this is what hydrocarbon or alkanes, that's an alkane, right? If you draw that out, um, tend to undergo. Okay. All right. Let's jump into these things. If I start going too fast, you guys slow me down. Okay, just let me know. So let's identify the functional groups. Somebody, I bet this is probably that clinic, but it's all term later. Um, fentanyl. So I don't know if you guys know this about fentanyl. It's like doctors use this, doctors dose people with fentanyl every day. It's like an analgesic anesthetic. Um, but the only content I usually hear about it is like street drugs. Okay, so this is the structure of fentanyl. Um, it's one of the deadliest ones out there. Now we sadly know people that have uh, OD'd on this stuff. So what are the functional groups that you guys see in fentanyl? The aromatic. Aromatic. Two of them, right? What else do you guys see? A ketone? Okay, where? I think it's either I get I get the ketones, esters, and esters all mixed up, but the one with the double bonded oxygen on it. Okay, we do see a carbonyl group there. We have to decide what kind it is. Is it, I mean, there's all different kinds. There's like uh Madison said there's ketones, aldehyde. So we know this is a CH3 group right here. Uh, but for it to be a true ketone, you would have to have a carbon right there. You have to have a carbon on both sides. Okay, so it's not a ketone. Is it an amide? An aldehyde? Mm -hmm. Amide, it's an amide. So an aldehyde, you would have to have a hydrogen on one side. An aldehyde, you have the carbonyl carbon, and then you have a hydrogen branched off of it. Okay, we don't have a hydrogen bonded to it. We see all four bonds on the carbon. It is what Maggie said, it's an amide, that right there. And you have a nitrogen, a nitrogen by itself bonded to other carbons, that's amine, but a nitrogen double bonded, or a nitrogen bonded to a carbonyl carbon, that's an amide. Oops. OK, 
Okay, what else do y'all see? The other nitrogen is an amine, right? That's right. Can anybody tell me whether it's primary, secondary, or tertiary? Is it tertiary? It is. It's bonded to three carbons. One, two, and three. Okay, so tertiary. All right. Um, I think I want to talk about isomers next. So that's the only example I'm going to work with functional groups. But if you're iffy on those, go review that whole table of functional groups. Let's talk about isomers. So what are isomers first off? Do I have a question on that? Um, yeah, probably this would be the first question, best question to start with. What's the difference between an isomer and a conformer? You guys tell me, what do y'all remember? Is it, oh gosh. Is it the ones where you have the, you have your C double bonded to another C in the middle and then you have your like off on each side of that C like there's two groups and you could flip them. And like social, you know what I'm talking about? Um, that's like the cis and trans stuff. Oh, that's what we'll, that is. Okay. We'll get there. That's not actually, this is a little more broad than that. That's a little more specific. That's a particular kind of isomer, Robin. Aren't isomers like the same, like compound just structurally different? That is an isomer, okay? It's got the, so same um, atoms, but they are connected differently. Okay. We call these structural isomers. But if we just say the word isomer, we mean a structural isomer. Okay. If I say isomer or structural isomer, that's the same thing. So a conformer um, is just a slight variation on this. A conformer is actually the same atoms in the molecule, all the same number and kinds of atoms. Um, so, uh, there, there are two molecules that have the same atoms, same connectivity. So all the atoms are connected in the exact same way, but it's just that they have a, a different spatial arrangement, a different um, atoms are, are positioned in different ways in space. So different, different spatial arrangement. <clears throat> and remember, you can convert these into one another. You can make them look like each other because carbon-carbon single bonds can rotate. So now that we've defined these two things, I've got two problems on this. Problems where I have like a parts A, B, and C, we might not work all those parts, but we for sure will do one or two examples. But for example, look at this molecule right here. We want to draw two structures that are isomers. So we didn't say conformers, specifically isomers. Same atoms in the molecule, just arranged or bonded together differently. So draw two structures that are isomers of each other. So these, your, your molecule is at four carbons, eight hydrogens, one chlorine, and one oxygen. So if it's set up like that, are we just like rearranging it just like that? Because I feel like whenever we did it like in class, it was like, I don't know, maybe it was like different structures. Yeah, you know like this I mean? one over here. We'll do this one too, Matt. Yeah, 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 like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so we'll for if it's like that, are we just rearranging it in that form, like move stuff around? Yeah, so just draw two molecules that have these atoms in it, just they're bonded together differently. Does that make sense? So, for example, somebody tell me what you've drawn for one of them. I don't know if mine's correct. If I did the four carbons, and in between carbon one and two, I did a double bond. 
And then I did the oxygen at the last carbon okay. and then the uh, chlorine added to the oxygen. And then you filled in all the hydrants? Yes. Okay, so there's one problem here. Is there too many hydrogens? Maybe you need to double bond somewhere else too. There's not enough hydrogens. There's only seven and we need eight. Oh, I see. So I guess you take the double bond off and then add a hydrogen to the oxygen? Um, hope I made this a doable structure. I just threw it down on paper last night. I didn't actually try to draw it out. So if we, we can't add a hydrogen to the oxygen because oxygen's already got two bonds. So if we add a hydrogen here, that's an issue because that carbon only has, has anybody got a good structure for it? Or has, is it impossible? Let's just say, has anybody got one? If not, I'm gonna modify the Lewis structure. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Cause I was like, if you put three on an end, it's gonna be uneven. Let's just make it nine hydrogens. Two. Okay, so we get a structure like that. And we get all the lumpers. I will make sure on the exam that they're doable. I would just literally threw that down on paper. Um, okay, so now is there a way we could rearrange this differently? There's all different kinds of ways. One thing you could do is just put the oxygen in between any of the carbons. And then you could, you could literally put this chlorine off of any spot where a hydrogen was. Okay, so that's just one example. There's many different, many different examples you could do here. Yours may look completely different than mine. At the end of the day, just make sure all your carbons have four bonds, all the hydrogens have one bond, Halogens have one bond. Atoms like oxygen have two bonds. Just make sure they obey the rules of Lewis structures. <coughs> okay. Over here, if we zoom in on this other question, which of the following are isomers, which are conformers, which are unrelated? So again, isomers are gonna be bonded together differently Conformers are honestly gonna look the exact same. Maybe they just, one bond is twisted up or twisted down. Um, unrelated means there's a different number and kind of atoms in the molecules. So we look at A, we got CH3, CH2, CH3. Then we got CH3, CH2, CH3. So what do y'all think about A? Is it a conformer? Yeah, they're identical. If we just bend this down and make it a flat, flat straight um, alkane, it looks exactly like the first structure. So these are conformers. Okay, what about B? We got CH3, NH, CH3. And then the next one, we got CH3, CH2, NH2. What do y'all think about this? Unrelated. Unrelated. So Cameron votes unrelated. Anybody agree or disagree? I agree. Is it an isomer? So let's, before we say it's unrelated, let's see, do we have the same kinds of atoms, same number of kinds of atoms? We've got two carbons, one, two, uh, two carbons. We've got three, four, 
five, six, seven hydrogens. And then we've got three, four, five, six, seven hydrogens in both, one nitrogen in both. So we have the same number of atoms, they're just connected differently. So if we if we wrote out always one key way to check is just write out the like the empirical formula um, or write out the um, the molecular structure. So this C two um, H seven N. Okay, and you would literally get that same thing for both. You have the same number and kinds of atoms. If you get the same thing, you know they're isomers if the things are just connected differently. So this is an these are isomers. Same number and kinds of atoms, just connected differently. It's different uh, connectivity. What do y'all think about C? Unrelated. Unrelated. You got an extra carbon on the bottom one, and you don't have that carbon connected to the oxygen on the top one. Everything else is the same, though. So different number and kinds of atoms. All right, so hopefully that jogged your memory on what isomers are. Any questions on those? This fridge is really loud. Okay, um, now we're gonna get into substituents. So remember, substituents are groups that are branched off of a molecule, and we have to know how to name those. So we can have all different kinds of groups, but I want you to draw a methyl, ethyl, propyl, and isopropyl group branched off of a benzene ring. So benzene looks like this. Okay, it's an aromatic ring. Draw an example of these groups branched off of a benzene ring. I don't care if you do one benzene ring or do an individual benzene ring for all of them. I'm just going to do one benzene ring. So a methyl group, if we're doing the line structure. You don't have to do line structures. I just like them because they're the easiest for me. Methyl is just going to look like that. An ethyl group I'll do in green would be a two carbon group, CH2, CH3. Propyl, I'll do in purple, um, would just be a three carbon group. CH2, CH2, CH3. Isopropyl, I'll do in pink. Um, we're still got a three carbon group connected through the center carbon. So it would end up looking like that. Okay, any questions? You guys probably remember this part. There's also butyl groups. So I wanted to put all four of the pictures on here because butyl is a little more complicated. So just remember there's, there's straight chain butyl groups. So we're connecting through like um, either the, the last carbon here is branched to the molecule or even the, one of the internal carbons but it's still all the carbons are straight in a row. So if you're connecting through the in carbon, that's just a butyl group. If you're connecting through a secondary carbon, it's a sec butyl group. This carbon is secondary because it's bonded to that carbon and that carbon. Now, when it's bonded to the molecule, it becomes a tertiary carbon. But as a substituent, just in, within the substituent group, it's a secondary carbon. That's why it's called sec butyl but it looks tertiary when it's actually bonded to the molecule. But here's the deal, it doesn't have to be bonded to another carbon, it could be bonded to like a nitrogen or an oxygen. So when you're just considering the, the substituent group, it's called sec, sec butyl, okay? Um, if you have an unbr, if you have a, sorry everyone. Um, if you have um, a branch chain of sorts, then 
you get isobutyl or terpbutyl. Okay, so isobutyl, um, you've got three carbons in a row and one methyl group branched off. Terpbutyl, um, you still have three carbons in a row and, and the methyl group branched off, but you are bonded through different carbons to your molecule. Here, you're bonded through a, the terminal, the end carbon, okay, that little red line right here. This is where you're going to connect to the molecule. You're connecting through the end carbon. The terpbutyl group, you're bonded through the very middle carbon, the tertiary carbon. So that's the butyl groups are the most complicated. I, I, I won't go past that. Like I won't put on like a um, pentyl or hexyl group. So these are the only alkane substituents you need to know how to name. Questions on these? Um, we're going to get into naming. So just we're going to do a little refresher on how to name the molecules. This stuff should probably um, be pretty easy for you guys now. But as a reminder, you always name the main chain. So look for the longest continuous chain of carbons. Name it according to the number of carbons in that chain. Always look carefully. You may have to turn corners. Okay. So for example, this one right down here. You've got to start with this carbon right here where the star is. That'd be carbon number one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, um, then number the carbon. So we number them, but you have to begin near the end of the first branch point, which I did. So you have to start at the end nearest the first branch point. And these are the branching points off carbon three. So that's why we had to start um, where the star is and not down here on carbon six. So identify the branching substituents and number each one. Number them according to their point of attachment to the main chain. If two substituents are on the same carbon, assign the same number to both. Each attached group must have its own number. So if we were to number these, we would say 3,3-dimethyl. Three, three Okay, we can't just say three dimethyl. Each methyl group gets its own number. So that's why it's three, three, one, three for each methyl group. Um, write everything in a single word. Use hyphens to separate the numbers and the prefixes. Use commas to separate numbers. If two or more different substituent groups are present, cite them in alphabetical order. So ethyl before methyl, okay? Um, isopropyl before propyl. So just in alphabetical order. If two or more identical groups, which is what we have on this example molecule, that's when you use prefixes as di, tri, or tetra. But not for alphabetizing purposes. For alphabetizing purposes, you're still just looking at the first letter in the actual name of the substituent. So methyl, ethyl, isopropyl. The di and the tri don't take precedence in alphabetical purposes. So 3,3-dimethyl, hexane, ane because it's an alkane. You know where I, I kind of get confused on this, looking at it? Um, on the 3,3-dimethyl? Yeah. Okay, there's a methyl group branched off the bottom. And when I look at the top of that third carbon that's number third carbon, to me, that looks like an ethyl group because it's a CH2 and a CH3. Exactly. So I, don't, I, I just get confused why it wouldn't be 3-ethyl-3-dimethyl or 3-ethyl-3-methyl hexane. Because let's see, let's, let's, I, I'm glad you brought this up. Let's explore this, Robin. If we do that and let's, so we have to number this two, three, four, five as the main chain, right? Oh, I see it now. I see it now. I see it now. I remember now. You have to number the longest continuous chain of carbons, even number. if you have to turn corners. So that's why if we number it like this, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is the longest chain. It's a one carbon longer. This is why okay. I put this example on here for that but reason. But hold on. Then why wouldn't it be... 
I think I'm thinking I'm I'm going too deep into it. I just need to look at it and know it. I'm going too deep. Because then I'm looking at the chain and I'm like, okay, well, it's numbered in the chain. Then the methyl group is numbered off the second carbon there. But it's okay. I got it. Uh, you got it? Yeah, I'll figure it out. This, when we number the longest chain, this, up, this ends up being carbon three. And then these are the substituents. So I'll highlight them. That's one substituent and that's another substituent. The main chain though is what I'm gonna highlight in blue here. This is the main chain. Now I see it, now I see it, now I actually see it. Okay, I got it, sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> All right. Write the condensed structure and the line structure for the molecule below. So condensed and line structures, these are just various ways to represent your molecules. So this one is gonna be a little interesting. Um, the way I, there's probably more than one acceptable answer, but I'll show you one appropriate answer for this. So remember, if we're write, writing the condensed structure, we think of it in groups. We look at the first carbon and we write everything branched off that first carbon in one group, so CH3. And then we've got a CH2, and we've got a CH2. So you can either write that as CH2, CH2, or you could write it as like that, meaning there's two in a row. Okay, now on this fourth carbon here, so I'm going to box this in in blue actually, we have this whole group branched off of that carbon, um, plus we have this hydrogen up here branched off of that carbon. So we've got to represent this, we're going to have to use parentheses, so I'm going to write CH to represent this whole part up here, that's the CH. But then I'm going to represent everything in this blue box beneath in a parentheses, so C um, H C H two, and you don't need a substituent. You don't need any number right here because there's just one group. So that lets us know that this whole group, when you just have parentheses with no substituents, that just lets us know that's branched off the preceding carbon. Then we have a C H and a C H and a N H. Okay, could you draw the line structure for that? Try to draw the line structure. I'll erase all my boxes. I'm going to start drawing it. it should look like this. Okay, did you get something like that? Don't let it confuse you that this part that is branched below, I actually branched up just because the way the lines worked out. It's okay if you branch it down below still, but that's the same group. Remember, you don't draw in all those hydrogens bonded to the carbons. I did show the hydrogens bonded to the nitrogen. And that's common to do. And then you show the double bonds. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, so here's practice with naming. For time's sake, uh, we're just gonna do the top one. And then if you want more practice, this is a good practice problem. 
So let's just name this one right up here. So we need to number the longest continuous chain. Remember, find the, find the chain of carbons that's the longest continuous chain, even if that is, includes something that looks branched. Okay, so when I numbered it, that's what I got. So the parent word here, what's gonna be the parent word for this alkane? You have a seven carbon chain. Hept. Thank you, Cameron, heptane. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that and get that off my brain. Now we need to figure out what parts are branched, what groups do we have branched and what are the branching points? Two and four. Okay. Now, what are the groups that are branched? This one is a methyl group. This one is, what is this one? Isn't that a isopropyl? Isopropyl. So alphabetically, which one goes first? The isopropyl. Okay, so it should be four. Isopropyl, two, methyl, heptane. Okay. Um, so here's a here's a whole bunch. If you notice, all these are cyclo, cyclo. So that would be a, a good one to practice for the cyclo alkanes. The only thing I'll remind you with naming cyclo alkanes is that, like, if you have um, for example. This is number number B. This is letter B right here. Uh, whoops, no, it's not. This would be B. Okay, you number um, so that the second branch. If you have two branch points on a cycloalkane, you try to number them so that they they get the lowest possible index numbers. So when I number this, I'm gonna. It doesn't matter which one you call one first. Um, here because the groups are identical. If they're not identical, you name the largest branch point as number one. So for example, if this was an isopropyl group branched off, that would be carbon, that would be carbon number one. But because the groups are both identical methyl groups, it does not matter here which one's a one. So if I number that one one, the, the way I need to number it is clockwise. If I try to number it counterclockwise like this, my second branched methyl is carbon four. And that's higher than if I tried to number this in a clockwise fashion, where it would be number three in that case. Okay, so it matters the, the way you number it if there's two branch points. And then it matters which carbon is number one if there's two branch points. You pick the, the one with the bigger substituent. You can also use the ortho meta para, okay, if the numbering starts to trip you up. Ortho meta para, which we might have a problem on that in a little while. Okay, uh, properties of alkanes. What kinds of intermolecular forces are dominant among alkanes? This should be a quick, like, immediate response in your head. What kind of intermolecular forces? Your options are hydrogen bonding, dipole forces, or London dispersion. Isn't it London dispersion? Yes. Okay, because these are non-polar molecules. All right, so if that's the case, what kind of solvents are alkanes soluble in? Polar solvents like water or non-polar solvents? Non-polar, because like non dissolves like. Yes, non-polar for exactly that reason, like dissolves like. All right, what affects melting and boiling points of alkanes? And how? You guys remember? Is it the number of their carbon bonds? Yeah, well, the number of carbons. So if I have something that looks like that versus a hydrocarbon that looks like this, 
That's a lot bigger. Which one do you think is going to melt or boil first? Oh, this on one. Right. Do what? The one on the right has higher melting and boiling, right? Yeah, this the one on yeah. the left has lower. The one on the right has a higher melting and boiling point. Okay, so simply put, the answer here is size. Size affects the melting and boiling point. How? The bigger they are, the higher the melting and boiling points. I have to erase my little chain down here because it got in the way of my next question, which we, yeah, I knew we had a problem on this. Write the products of the following combustion reaction. What are the only two things you need to write? H2O and CO2. Yep. And then you would just balance it. Okay. That's chapter 12 in a nutshell. And that took us 47 minutes, 40 minutes, actually. So here's the deal, we'll get as far as we can today, but we have to stop at like 10.45, take a little break so that I can probably actually maybe even 10.30, take a break so I can snap the pictures of y'all exams and get those to you so that we leave time to go over exam four. Uh, I have something right at noon. I've got to be at, so I want to get down a little bit before that. We've got to be done at least by 1145. Uh, okay, chapter 13. Main topics for chapter 13. This is the chapter on alkenes, okay? So we had alkenes, um, cis-trans isomers, properties of alkenes, um, the reaction. So there's a lot more reactions here. We only had the combustion reaction with alkanes, but alkenes can do addition, substitution, elimination, and rearrangements. Different kinds of addition reactions. So these are all addition reactions. Was hydrogenation, halogenation, and hydration. Okay. Which follows Markovnikov's rule. So we'll have to bring that up again. Then we briefly talked about benzene and aromatics, substituted aromatics. Okay. So real quick, let's talk about naming benzenes. So I'm actually kind of starting right down here with this last topic really quick, and then we'll, then we'll go through the rest in order. Um, so benzene is the aromatic ring and it can be substituted Monosubstituted means there's just one branch group attached to one of the carbons. Disubstituted means you have more than one group. You got two groups. So you're going to use for monosubstituted, you're going to use benzene as the parent name. And you don't even need to number anything because the substituted carbon is carbon number one. But you don't have to tell us that because there's just one group attached. So we'll, we'll know how to draw it. So for example, if you have a bromine bonded to your benzene, it's bromobenzene. If you have an ethyl group as a substituent, it's ethyl benzene. If you have this NO2 group, it's nitro benzene. Okay. If you have a disubstituted benzene, that means you've got two branch groups attached to different carbons. Use benzene as the parent name, unless it has a common name, then use the common name. Here are common names. Toluene. Everyone say toluene. Toluene. Thank you, Cameron. Um, that's a that's a methyl group branched off the benzene. Okay, then we got phenol. Okay, that's an OH group branched off the benzene. Aniline. That's an NH two group branched off the benzene ring. Okay, I'm not going to put xylene, uh, benzoic acid. We get to in chapter 17, but uh, benzaldehyde we get to later. But for the sake of chapter 13 stuff. The main three common names I want you to know is toluene, phenol, and aniline. 
Will this table be on the exam or will we need to know? Um, this table will probably, I don't, if it, again, if it's one I gave you in the past, I'll have to just go look at the ones. I don't think this was one that I gave you. I gave you the one from chapter 17, which had all the different car carboxylic acids, but I don't think I gave you this one. There's a family we know, they named their daughter Anna Lee, but it, my chemistry mind, guess what it did? I was like, they almost named their daughter after a compound, Anna Lee, but I didn't tell them that. Um, okay, so remember ortho meta para? Ortho, and it doesn't just have to be on a hexane group, it could be on a pentane group or any other cycloalkane or aromatic. Um, Ortho is a one, two substitution pattern. Meta is a one, three substitution pattern. Para is a one, four substitution pattern. You can use O, M, or P to abbreviate those. Okay, so now that we've gone over that, um, we're gonna go back to the top one. I just wanted to get all the naming out of the way. So naming alkenes, and we're gonna practice some naming. Actually, don't have a table or a slide for all the rules for naming alkenes because they pretty much follow all the rules for naming alkanes. The only thing that's different is that you have to tell us the number of the first carbon in the double bond and you have to give it the lowest possible index number, <clears throat> okay? So I'm not gonna do everything in 1336 here, but let's start with A. The double bond, if we're numbering this, I can either number it starting from the left or the right, but I wanna uh, give the double bonded carbons the lowest possible index numbers. So if I wanna do that, I've got to start numbering from the left. So that'd be carbon one, two, three, four, five. So last chapter we'd say, okay, pentane, but it's not a pentane, it's a pentene, E-N-E. -E. The E-N-E -E lets us know there's a double bond, but then we also have to include a number to tell us where in the chain the double bond exists. So we just say two pentene. Sorry, there's a, there's a hyphen in between those two. Pentene two lets us know that it starts on carbon two and that it exists between carbons two and three. Okay, how would we number B? Or how would we do B? This is a triple bond, so the name ending is Y-N-E. So remember we have alkanes, alkenes, alkynes. This would be an alkyne. So again, find the longest continuous chain of carbons. You could either start here or here. Actually, it's totally symmetrical, so you could start at any extremity of the molecule, and I think you'd get the same number. So I'm just gonna start here. That's carbon one, two, three, four, five, and six. If you started opposite, if you started on the right side and numbered to the left, you would get the same, same name here. And now that we've numbered this, we have two methyl groups, one on carbon two and one on carbon five. So this will be two, five, di, dimethyl three hexine. I think you get the gist of it now. I bet you could do C pretty easily on your own. And, um, and D, how would you do D? There's two, there's two double bonds here. You again would just number it. And when you number this, so it would be a hexene, you would just number the substituents, account for all those. When you go to name the parent name here, you would say two, four, 
hexene. And these, this two and this four would let us know there's two double bonds and where they start or where they exist in the molecule. And, and then you do all the substituents as your prefix information. You would include that info on the, on the methyl groups. Okay. Um, let's at least do one of, of these. Do you want to do A, B, or C? I will tell you. Um, one of these has a common name. Do you all know which one it is? A, B, or C? Is it phenol? Yep, C. Let's actually just name that one. So the phenol part is right here. So the parent name here will be phenol. So let's use the ortho, meta, or para. Meta. Mm -hmm. So it'd be M nitrophenol. We would scoot this over, make it one word. Okay. And you would let us know if we needed to do the common or the IUPAC, because it says IUPAC at the top, so. Yeah, I broke the rules here, didn't I? I'll tell okay. you. <laughs> so the IUPAC name would be one, three, well, um, just three nitrophenol. Well, no, if you're doing the, the naming for the IU pack, how would we name that? Robin's got me on a, on a trail here now. Well, you have, you have a nitro group and that's a hydroxy group, right? Mm-hmm. Which one takes uh, alphabetical preference? The um, hydroxy group. Yeah, so it'd be one, three. So one hydroxy. Three nitro benzene would be the IUPAC name. Okay. Whoop. So that is naming a little bit. Uh, now cis-trans isomers, cis-trans isomers. So remember molecules that have a double bond that are alkenes, um, you can't have this with alkynes. So only alkenes can have cis-trans isomers. Alkanes cannot and alkynes cannot, alkenes can. Um, it means you've got some kind of double bonded carbons here and they have substituents. It could be a methyl group, it could be um, a hydrogen, okay? It could be an ethyl group. It could be all different things. Um, if you have carbon, a carbon that has two identical things branched off, so for example, a carbon that has two identical methyl groups, you cannot have cis trans isomers, okay? But if you have carbons that both have two different groups, then you can have cis trans isomers. So the molecule I just drew, you don't have cis trans isomers. Uh, but if you have two, both carbons in the double bond have different, remember it helps to kind of draw the double bond and then think of the branching points as the sides, tops and bottoms. So we're gonna practice drawing cis-trans isomers with two hexene. So if I were to draw it as a straight chain, um, look like this and the double bond is gonna be right here on carbon two, between carbon two and three. So if I zoom in, I'm gonna redraw this. I'm gonna draw these carbons in the double bond straight. So there's a carbon, there's a carbon. And I know that on this carbon right here, there's a hidden hydrogen. And then on this carbon right here, there's a hidden hydrogen. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw. They look like they're pointing opposite directions. So I'm gonna draw them on opposite directions. And then I'm gonna draw the other groups 
I've got a one, two, three carbon substituent. And I've got a one carbon substituent. Okay. So is this or the is this the cis or the trans isomer that I just drew? Trans. Trans. Because these carbon substituents are pointing opposite directions. The alkyl, we call these alkyl groups. Al alkyl just means some kind of carbon-based substituent group. So now draw the cis. All you do is draw the double bonded carbons and you're just gonna put them on the same side now. And then both of those hydrogens will be on the same side as well. Questions on this? Okay, um, this is a really good problem to practice. Which of the following substances can exist as cis trans isomers? Um, I'm just gonna do, let's just look at A. And then I think if you come back to this later on your own time, we'll do A together though, but I wanna try to get through more material. So two, three, dimethyl, two, pentene. So let's just draw this out first. Don't worry about drawing this, the cis or the trans. We just need to draw it out and see, can it even have cis or trans? So first I'm gonna draw pentene with a double bond between carbons two and three. So pentene, one, two, three, four, five. The double bond is gonna be right here. You can also draw it out like this. If you want. And then we have a two, three dimethyl. So off of carbon two is a CH3, and off of carbon three is a CH3. So if you're continuing the line structure, it would look like this. And then you can just fill in the hydrogens. Uh-oh, is my pencil going out? Oh, let me see if my pencil's going out. Usually it'll show me. It's probably out if it's not right. It's probably out. Oh no. Okay, so I want you to, I need to charge this for a minute. Yeah, it's not showing up. So what that means I have to do is I have to unplug my, uh, I have to unplug my iPad. So that means I have to stop sharing my screen for a minute. So I want you to continue with this and let's just answer. I'm going to unplug. So sorry, everyone. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. If I charge this for like five minutes or just a couple minutes, it should be fine after this. Based on what you just drew and what we drew for A, what do you all think about 2,3-dimethyl-2-pentene? Can that have cis-trans isomers? No. Okay, why, Robin? Because you have a... Uh... You have two methyl groups on the same side. That's exactly right. So carbon number two in the, in the pentene has two methyl groups bonded to it. Okay. Um, so it cannot have cis trans isomers. Carbon number three has two different groups. It's got a methyl group and it has a, um, an ethyl group branched off of it. But that first carbon number two, it has two identical methyl groups, so you cannot get cis trans isomers. So you would approach B and C the same way with the two methyl, two hexene, and two hexene. You do the same thing there. All right, I'm going to scroll to the next slide. I know you can't see my screen, but I want you to go to the next slide where it says classify the following reactions as addition, elimination, or substitution. So what do y'all think about A? So in A, we have CH3 and then a CH double bonded to CH2. So there's a double bond there and we're adding hydrogen 
And then on the product side, you have CH3, CH2, CH3. So on the reactant, you have the double bond. And on the product, it looks like the double bond is gone. And both of those hydrogens haven't been incorporated into the molecule. So what do y'all think about A? Is it addition, elimination, or substitution? Is it addition? It is. Hydrogen is simply added. One hydrogen goes to each carbon from the double bond. So A is addition. What do y'all think about B? You've got CH3, CH2, CH2OH, and then you have an acid catalyst, and then you have CH3, CH, double bond CH2, and you made water. So it looked like from our reactant molecule, we lost the OH group and then a hydrogen as well off of carbon number two. Okay, I think I have enough charge on my Apple Pencil now. Yeah, I'm at 19%, we're good. Let me share over again. What do y'all think about? What do y'all think about B? Is B elimination? Yes, it is. So if you draw this out, And you got all the hydrogens. Okay, what happened is this and one of the hydrogens on carbon two, doesn't matter. I'm just gonna say the bottom one. Left, those left and those go and make water, which is what you see as a product. And when those leave, we get a double bond. Okay, so this is definitely elimination. The easiest way to think about this is you had one reactant, you get two products. That's elimination. The easiest way to think about A is you had two reactants, one product, things combine. And B, things split apart. Um, C, what happens on C? You have CH3, CH2, Cl, and KOH, and then you have CH3, CH2OH, and KCl. In that substitution. Definitely. The, the OH and the CL, they substitute for each other. They switch places. Okay, so a lot can happen with double bonds. You can take away a double bond or add a double bond. You get different kinds of reactions that way. We're not going to do all these practice problems, but um, this is another way you could be tested on these things. So write the structure of the product from the following hydrogenation or halogenation reactions. Hydrogenation, we haven't even defined this yet. What is hydrogenation? Hydrogen, it's a type of a, these are types. Of addition. Reaction. So if you notice, every single one of these reactants is an alkene. There is a double bond in the molecule, and then we are adding something to it, and it eliminates the double bond. The double bond goes away. So here in A, we're adding hydrogen. So that makes it a hydrogenation. Hydrogenation is when you're adding hydrogen across a double bond, and it requires a metal catalyst, usually palladium. I'm not going to ask you what the catalyst is on an exam, but I may show you a reaction like this. You see a metal catalyst. That's a good signifier that hydrogenation is happening. Um, I don't know what I did. Okay, so your product should just look like that. The double bond just goes away. If it want, if it helps you to see where the hydrogen's added, by all means, draw them in. Okay, B and C are the same way. 
We can do a bromination or a chlorination. These are um, these are halogenation reactions. Okay, so one pentene. would just look like this, CL and CL when you're done. Okay, one, one pentene, I didn't draw out just one pentene. But it looks like that. And so each one chlorine was added to each carbon of the double bond. Questions on this? All right, next thing then, hydration. So we have it, the types of addition reactions, we got the halogenation, hydrogenation, and hydration is the last one. But before we talk about hydration, there's a rule that applies to hydration, that's Markovnikov's rule. Anybody remember what Markovnikov's rule is? You don't have to tell me verbatim, but what's the gist of it? So far, we have been adding identical atoms, two hydrogens or two chlorines, same atoms across the double bond. Now we're about to add different atoms. Markovnikov's rule says when you're adding um, two different kinds of atoms or groups of atoms. So for example, think about water. Water is H2O. We're gonna split it up into just H and OH. Okay, so we have in OH, we have this very electronegative oxygen, all right? So these are different groups because a hydrogen is not electronegative and OH group is very electronegative. These are gonna be added across a double bond. All right, so if we had something like this and the double bond is right here, I want you to look at, we understand we got a hydrogen right here. Which carbon atom would the hydrogen bond to which carbon atom would the OH group go to? I guess I should maybe draw this in red because it's just part of the original structure. Okay, I'm about to sneeze. <coughs> Doesn't the OH group go to the carbon atom with the most like, you know, carbons on it or something yes. like that? Yes, Robin, that's the gist of Markovnikov's rule. So what Robin just said, the OH group is going to go to, will bond to the um, more substituted carbon. Okay, so if we're ranking them primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, it will go to the one who has a higher level of substitution, like a, a secondary, tertiary, or a quaternary before a primary. So let's see if we can rank our carbons. This will, the hydrogen will always bond to the carbon with lower substitution. That's what Markovnikov's rule says. It just tells what it's useful for, it just tells us how the groups will bond to the, the molecule. So Let's see, can we identify um, what kind of substitution do our two carbons right here and right here have? Well, one's a primary and then, oh, hold on. You, you don't have any? You don't have any, neither one of them are primary. Oh, hold on. Well, I know the H is gonna go on the left side and the OH is gonna go on the right side. Okay, that's <laughs> fair enough, Robin. This one is a tertiary. This one is a quaternary. The one on the left has three bonds to carbon. The one on the right has all four bonds to carbons. This is a carbon, that's a carbon, and we know that's a carbon. And then you got to count for the double bond is two bonds to carbon. All right, so that what Robin said, it means that the hydrogen will go to the lower substituted carbon and the OH group will go to the higher substituted carbon. That's how these things will bond. When that happens, the double bond goes away. 
That is Markovnikov's rule, and that is hydration reaction. Okay. So let's do, let's just do one practice. Which one looks the hardest to you guys? I think either A or B will be the hardest. Let's just do B. So I want to identify, here's the two carbons in the double bond. Tell me what, what level of substitution are these secondary, primary, tertiary, ordinary carbons? Let's do the top carbon, top highlighted carbon first. Tertiary. Remember the double bond though. It's got one bond to carbon, two bonds to carbon, three bonds to carbon, all four bonds are to carbon. So it's coordinating. Okay, now what about the bottom carbon? Tertiary. Yep. So same level of substitution that we just dealt with up above on the previous slide. So that means where will the hydrogen go? Where will the OH group go? Oh, it's up top and hydrogen bottom. That's right. So that's what your product would look like. And remember, these require a strong acid catalyst. So that is hydration, Markovnikov's rule. Well, that's all the addition reactions hydrogenation, halogenation, hydration. Okay, that is 12 and 13. Wow, we're really moving here. Um, so we still have 14 and 15. We'll see how far we get. We may only get through 14. Um, chapter 14 was alcohols, phenols, and ethers. Alcohols, phenols, and ethers. And then we talked briefly about their properties, reactions that alcohols can undergo, and then we hit stereochemistry at the very end. So let's see how far we get with this. Naming alcohols, phenols, and ethers. First off, let's just identify what is an alcohol, what is a phenol, what is an ether. So look at one, two, and three here. Which one's an alcohol, phenol, or ether? Or let's just label each one. What do y'all think about one? Alcohol. alcohol. Yep. What do y'all think about two? Ether. Ether. Yep. I think about three. Phenol. Okay. So now we're going to give systematic names and we're going to classify them as these are just all alcohols. So we're talking about naming alcohols. Um, and before we actually do these, here's the rules. I'm going to remind you of the rules just below. When you're naming an alcohol, name the parent compound. Identify the continuous chain of carbons. Um, or the number of carbons in the ring if it's cyclic, and then name it by re replacing the E ending with an OL ending. So if it was hexane, it becomes hexanol. If it was cyclopentane, it becomes cyclopentanol. Okay, OL ending. That indicates there's an OH group in the mix. Step number two, number the carbon atoms in the main chain. Um, in a straight chain, the carbon bearing the OH group must be assigned the lowest index number possible. All right, so for example, if we're looking at this one right here, do I start numbering one, two, three, four, five, six, or do I number it one, two, three, four, five, six? If I number it this way, this carbon with the OH group gets the lowest possible number, okay? In a cyclic alcohol, the carbon that bears the OH group is number one, okay? And then you continuing number, continue the numbering so that the other substituents get the lowest possible index numbers, all right? 
Then you just write the name, place the number that locates the hydroxyl group immediately before the parent name, just like we did with hexenes, uh, or sorry, alkenes. Um, you just put the number for the double bond right in front of the parent name. Same thing here with the OH groups. So this would be one butanol. You just put that one there to indicate where the OH is. So in a cyclic alcohol, you don't have to include the one. So if we were gonna name this up here, we would just say two methyl um, cyclohexanol. So I don't have to put the one there because we know that it's number one. So writing the one is redundant because per the rules, what the rules say, we know the OH is gonna be on carbon one. But you do have to include the number of the OH group in a straight or branch chain alcohol. Still number the substituents, still write them alphabetically, still include numbers and use the commas and the hyphens. So now let's go back up. A, what's the longest continuous carbon chain? One, two, three, no matter how you number this. You could have numbered one, two, three. You could have numbered one, two, three. No matter how you do it, you have a three carbon chain and the OH group is on carbon two. <coughs> then we have a substituent. It's also on carbon two, it's a methyl group. No matter how you number it, you have a methyl group on carbon two. So um, this would be two methyl. And then it would be two propanol. Prop is the kind of the parent part of a three carbon chain. Two methyl, two propanol. What do y'all think about B? Someone do B and tell me what B is. How do you name that? Would it be three methyl two um, butanol? Close, pentanol. Pentanol, that's what I meant. That's five. Exactly right. So what Robin said, so we're numbering this one, two, three, four, five. So it's pentanol. We got a methyl group on carbon three, an OH group on carbon two. So we'll say three methyl two pentanol. Okay. So all coming back to you guys. All right, properties of alcohol. I had a whole big question uh, just on this concept right here on I think exam one. So um, this is a little more confusing than other functional groups that we've looked at to this point because we now have um, two different parts to the molecule. So I want you to look at this uh, propanol, for example, one propanol. We have this whole part, um, I'll do it in blue. This whole part of the molecule is hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Hydrophilic? No, hydrophobic. Hydrophobic, okay, it's, non <laughs> it's nonpolar. But the other part that I'm going to box in in red here, this is electronegative. We've got a dipole here um, pointing towards the oxygen. We got all these low pairs on the oxygen. So this is polar, and this is hydro. I feel like because water is also polar. So we're learning right now about um, 
the types of intermolecular forces in alcohols, and then also their solubility. The larger the hydrocarbon part, the more alkane like, and the less water soluble alcohols are. The larger, so if this, if this nonpolar part were to just, uh, it's not the color black, just keep extending, boom, 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 and get bigger and bigger and bigger. That means the nonpolar part of the molecule keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the more nonpolar something is, the less water soluble it is. Okay. So remember, alcohols that have a carbon to oxygen ratio of one to one or one to two or one to three, those are water soluble. All right. So anything that's a methanol to propanol. So methanol, ethanol, propanol. Those are your water soluble alcohols. Butanol is kind of where you begin to lose solubility. Um, that's a four to one carbon oxygen ratio. Pentanol and higher, pentanol, hexanol, heptanol, octanol, nonanol. That's a weird one. Um, those are all alcohols, anything bigger, those are not water soluble. The hydrocarbon nonpolar portion is just dominant at that point. Okay, that's why when you look at all the lipids and you see these huge long hydrocarbon tails, I mean, Lipids display this property and this, um, what we're seeing right here, perfectly. They're not water soluble. They, they do have a hydrophilic head, but that's why they form into shapes like micelles and uh, uh, what's the other one I'm thinking of? I forget it right now, but these uh, structures where the hydrophobic tails are buried on the inside. And this also affects boiling point, melting point. Look at this problem right here. You guys might remember this from lecture rank the following according to their boiling point. So if you look at A, B, C, and D, the only thing that's different is the number of OH groups, the OH content. The more OH groups, the more hydroxy groups, hydroxyl groups you have in your molecule, the more polar it is, the more water soluble it is, the more hydrogen bonding you can have, right? Because these groups can hydrogen bond. Let's show how they can hydrogen bond. Okay, here's a little water molecule. And we know that the hydrogens are partial positive, the lone pair on the oxygen is partial negative, and they really like each other. So they can hydrogen bond. We can also hydrogen bond with another mole water molecule. This hydrogen is partial positive, except the lone pairs on this oxygen. You can get hydrogen bonding that way. The rest of the molecule cannot hydrogen bond, but that OH group can. So the more hydrogen bonding something can engage in, definitely the higher the boiling point, the more energy and heat it takes to break those molecules apart and vaporize them. So you got one OH group right here, then you have two OH groups, no OH groups, and then three OH groups. So rank the following according to boiling point, highest to lowest. So which will have the highest? D. What did you say? D. As in dog? Yeah. Okay. Then what? Then B, then A, then C. Great. That's perfect. Any questions on this? Okay, you could crush that on an exam, right? Hopefully. Confidently, Cameron, confidently. All right, um, we're almost done. We're right at 1030 here. Let me get through redox and then we're gonna be done. This is the last slide we're gonna do. Because we still had several slides on chapter 14, but that's okay. Redox, this is really important. Um, let's define redox, okay? Redox is not just the giving or receiving of electrons anymore. We're considering the number of carbon hydrogen or carbon oxygen bonds. So anything that increases your carbon oxygen bonds, that is oxidation. Anything that decreases that or increases your number of carbon hydrogen bonds is reduction, all right? 
So reaction of alcohols. Remember, we did, um, we just did this earlier. We took an alcohol and we can do a dehydration, okay? Um, when we do dehydration, by the way, actually, I didn't talk about this. When we do dehydration, which is the opposite of hydration, the hydrogen will be removed typically from a more internal carbon so that the product alkene has a higher level of substitution, all right? Uh, so if these were hydrogens right here, we would not remove the hydrogen from the outer external carbon. We remove it from a more internal carbon. So that's why this hydrogen and that, that OH goes go away. And you get an alkene. So that's dehydration. But this is also um, a, a type of redox reaction. We have this carbon oxygen bond that I'm going to highlight right here, and we're removing that. We're making it into a carbon carbon. So we're reducing the number of carbon oxygen bonds. We're, we're reducing the molecule. This is reduction. All right. So that's dehydration, loss of water uh, from the molecule. The OH comes off of one carbon, and the hydrogen comes off the adjacent carbon, usually the more internal carbon, strong acid catalyst. Um, the product is an alkene, yields an alkene. Okay. Okay, now oxidation reactions. Um, we did redox all through this course, and it started right here in chapter 14. So you guys maybe can help me fill in these blanks. When you have a primary alcohol, a secondary alcohol, tertiary alcohol, it kind of, they yield different things. But if we're just doing oxidation, someone remind me, you can do mild oxidation or strong oxidation of primary alcohols. Mild oxidation of a primary alcohol yields a what? Does anybody remember? Whoops. So for example, let's say we have this carbon, it's a primary alcohol bonded to one of the carbon. And then you have some sort of oxidizing agent. Claire, did you try to say it? I might be wrong. Is is it an aldehyde? It is an aldehyde. You're not wrong. So what happens is these, uh, one of those hydrons plus that hydrogen go, and you form a double bond. So what you get okay, that's an aldehyde. Mild oxidation. What if we keep going? Strong oxidation, let's, let's continue to oxidize this thing. This, I think oh. I remember, it doesn't yield a carboxylic acid? It does yield a carboxylic acid. So, uh, draw it in teeny tiny over here. So we've gone from having one carbon oxygen bond to two carbon oxygen bonds, all the way to three carbon oxygen bonds. We're definitely oxidizing by increasing the number of carbon oxygen bonds each time. That's with primary alcohols. What if you have a secondary alcohol? So that would look like this. And that carbon is bonded to two other carbons. When you oxidize that, what do you get? Ketone. Thank you. Yep. Perfect. Camera in a ketone. Okay, what about a tertiary carbon? That's a carbon. Um, so we, we got a, one thing I did not draw in. I wanna, it's important that I draw this in. We still have this hydrogen on that carbon. Tertiary, what about a tertiary alcohol? That means you got a carbon bonded to three other carbons. What happens when we oxidize that? There's no reaction, right? 
it yields a big fat nothing. Okay, no reaction because there's no hydrogen, no hydrogen here. So you, you have to be able to pull a hydrogen off that carbon or that, that uh, OH bearing carbon. Okay. All right, um, that gets us a decent way through chapter 14. What was left was naming with phenols. We, we kind of did some of this earlier, so, but we did not hit ethers. Um, so that's really important that we hit ethers and then thiols and disulfides. And then we had a, a slide on steric chemistry and that was three of the four chapters. So um, I'm really not surprised that we didn't get all the way through this. To do that, we would just have to move at a really, really crazy pace. But um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hop off here and I'm gonna start scanning your exams to you. And let's get back on right at 11 and um, we'll go through exam four together, okay? So take about a 20, 23 minute break. All right, if there's any questions, I'll stick around. If not, I'm gonna start scanning your exams. Are, <clears throat> are we going to finish um, the review, the rest of it, or are we just going to go over the test? Um, we're going to go over the test first, Maggie, because I think it's critical we get through that for you guys to give you feedback yeah. on it. But if we have any time left over, we'll try to finish whatever slides we can. I just have to be done at 1145. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. See you all in a bit.